why should we think about or care about discipling our volunteers? Isn't recruiting them and getting them like to show up enough? I think you got to start by setting expectations. My job as a paid youth worker is to lead adults well so that then they can pastor the students. Hey, welcome back to the Rethinking Youth Ministry podcast. My name is Shane, and today we're having a really, really important conversation about discipling your volunteers, what we're rethinking about discipling your volunteers. And I'm surrounded mm. by some great friends and incredibly brilliant people. I'd love for you to meet them. To my left, your right, if you're watching, is... Hey, my name is Charlie Condor, and I'm an Orange Student Specialist, a ministry coach, and this is my 25th year working with students. Let's go. I That's know, amazing. Good. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, my name is Ayubu. I am also Orange Student Specialist and one of the newer ones on the team. So I'm just um, getting my feet wet and uh, 20 plus years of ministry and just um, so excited to be here. And so, dude, your feet are are plenty. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, they're soaked. I, I don't, that feels weird to say, but like, yes. Like, come on, dude, 20 years. That's a big deal. That's amazing. Caitlin. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Caitlin. I'm a student pastor uh, here locally in Cumming been in student ministry for about nine years now and absolutely love everything about it. That's so good. That's so good. We, yeah, we are, uh, spoiler alert, we're in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and Caitlin's right down the road from, from um, where our offices are, which is really cool. Okay, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because this topic is a big one, discipling our volunteers. Uh, where I want to start, though, is like, why should we think about or care about discipling our volunteers? Isn't recruiting them and getting them like to show up enough? Why would we even go into discipling? Well, recruitment is always hard. Mm -hmm. we, we can acknowledge that. However, I think the people who speak into the lives of your students, like they're the pastor of those students. So their spiritual walk matters so much Oof. as they're the most influential person in the life of the student when they sit with them in that circle. Oh, that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And I just think if we can really be intentional about that, I think we can we often as youth pastors create so many issues down the road for ourselves because we aren't thinking forwardly like that. And we recruit just warm bodies sometimes and then shoot ourselves in the foot later down the road when we could have just started from the beginning being really intentional about that yeah. oh, that's conversation. Good. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I think like from a youth pastor standpoint, like you fill spots, like when you need them. And a lot of time it's like urgent because you're like, oh, leader moved or stopped leading. And I need someone in here immediately. And you don't think about the spiritual growth or their relationship with God all the, like that mm -hmm. much. But if they're constantly going to be pouring out into the lives of students, shouldn't we be making sure that they're getting poured into and they're 100%. growing and yeah. they're walking that faith walk too? Yeah, that's really good, Caitlin. Like that's how I would translate what you said, Charlie. I feel like I know what you would want to say is like, shouldn't shouldn't we do that like if they're discipling students shouldn't we disciple them right it feels like a no-brainer yeah i know but it but it's not always no because we're why busy. do you think that is okay when we're busy just like what caitlin was saying you have um these moments where someone's got to come in clutch and so bob looks great he's at church every sunday why not bring bob into the fold and can you please lead these seventh grade boys mm -hmm. yeah but what if bob doesn't have the spiritual maturity Ooh. And then as a Yubu was saying, it derails things later and you're like, oh, also, it's really hard to go back when an adult has said something to hurt a student. Oh, wow. And if our goal is to do no harm in wow. the lives of students, mm. gosh, the conversation in the front, no matter if there's no one to lead the seventh grade boys this week or not, mm -hmm. I think we have to start with that first. That's like, really good. That's really good, Charlie. Ayubu, I, I feel like you were pointing to this idea that you, you got to push the volunteers to the front of their lives. Like they're the ones who are actually pastoring and, and investing in the lives of students. But that's probably a bit of a mind shift for some leaders or some youth ministry workers who are like, I, I mean, I signed up to do youth ministry, so I can't put that responsibility in the hands of my volunteers. What would you say to that youth leader? I would say... If you want to stay in youth ministry for the long term, you've got to learn that s quickly yeah. because you will get so burnt out so quickly yeah. because you're carrying such a heavy burden. And I just, I remember being in youth ministry when I first started and not understanding that. Yeah. And the moment when I started living that out and realizing that and really making that a part of my ministry, it was the the weight that comes off your shoulders and 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 realizing that 
the team can can walk together it's it's transforming yeah yeah that's huge caitlin i i know that this is something you do like this is a bit of the culture that you've built at local what what was it that taught you or who was it that taught you to do this early in ministry um i think like the model that i've like followed personally with like how i disciple my volunteers how i meet with them like <clears throat> how i like make sure they're getting what they need as leaders is something that was modeled for me when i was just leading a small group oh, and the person great. who was my group's director the way she poured into me and checked in on me and made sure that like i wasn't giving more than i had oh, was something good. that like every single time i sit down with a leader is what i have in the back of my mind yeah i know what she did for me and i know the difference that it made for me and so I just try to implement that personally every time. That's so good. That's so good. Okay, so I want us to imagine maybe the inverse of what we're talking about right now. Does anybody have any horror stories of where this hasn't went well? <laughs> or or not necessarily discipling hasn't went well, but maybe there was a gap in discipling volunteers and it turned into a situation. Well, and I'll I'll say this. Yeah. Like I I remember um so and Charlie remembers, so Charlie and I worked together, but... Plot twist, we uh, worked together. <laughs> you were going to tell your story. We, we worked together for a decade, no, so but, yeah. Or, or but plot twist, Ayubu is the volunteer that you want to talk about. <laughs> that would have been that so That would have been good. amazing, yeah. No, but I remember, not horror story, but but the reason why this is so important, um, because um, my oldest son was born with a medical issue, and I had to take two and a half months, three months away from ministry. Yeah. And yeah. the horror of had if you don't think about that yeah and you have like and all of a sudden your life yep has has to take a pause yep mm -hmm. the ministry can you have to have volunteers yeah yep. yeah no, and so, so it's so valuable to think that you might not you might have those moments of pause in your life that you need yeah. some, like people that you need to have done that process yeah yeah and I think another piece of that, like for me personally, I had some medical issues and had to step away in an emergency surgery. Mm. And of course you're panicked because you've got like all these kids and you're like, what's going to happen when I'm not there? And then you, you call your team and you're asking key volunteers like, well, we didn't really even know you were gone. Right. Mm. But that's the best conversation ever. Like you tuck the ego in the back pocket and you're like, you didn't even know I wasn't there. So that's when you know you've done something right yeah. with discipling yeah, your volunteers. That's amazing. That's amazing. Caitlin. Have, have you ever had a volunteer say something that you're like, oh, no, I have to clean that up after? Um, I don't have any instances that come to mind, like, immediately yeah. of that. But there's definitely been, like, conversations that, like, I've overheard, like, just walking through the room when small group breaks out where it's like, oh, we need to, you know, just circle back and touch on that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Nothing, like, crazy, no. like, outrageous. But, like, there have definitely been times when, like, stuff said that it's like, Maybe we put that in a volunteer training down the road and just make sure that we're uh, looking out for that in the future type stuff. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I remember once when we were gearing up for an event and uh, somebody on my team had found out that we were going to ask volunteers to lead, help lead communion mm -hmm. at this event. Like just walk through it. And this team member of mine was actually incredibly concerned that volunteers like wouldn't know what to do. And that was a, a, a moment that I was confronted with the reality that I, I just couldn't help but think if they don't know what to do, then we have not discipled them yeah. well. Like, mm. I mean, this is yeah. thousands of years old. <laughs> like literally <laughs> Jesus, like this is the last supper we are, we are participating in this thing. And it's like, it's funny to laugh about now, but I realized that's my responsibility as a leader to help them feel comfortable, mm -hmm. not just in those settings, yeah. but comfortable enough with some of the basic tenets of our faith to be able to lead students through them. So I'm curious, like, have there been moments like that for you all as you've led? Or um, what, has, what has caused you to confront the reality that discipling volunteers actually really matters? I mean, I think, like, we all want to feel, like, if we're leading a ministry, we want to all know, like, check your ego, like you said, Charlie, but, like, we want to know that if we walk away, the ministry is not going to fail and it's not going to fall apart just because mm -hmm. you're not there. Like mm. we want our leaders to be able to step in. And yeah. like I've had Sundays where like I'm gone just on like a family trip or something. And I know in the back of my head that the leaders a hundred percent have it, whether I'm there or not, they know what they're doing. They're yeah. there for the right reason. And they yep. care enough good. that Sunday is going to happen whether or not I'm around. That's good. That's so. good. 
also think discipling your volunteers is far more than maybe just their spiritual walk. Disciple them in a way that their everyday lives look like, I don't know how I'm trying to say this because I've had volunteers that post stuff on social media yep. and I was like, oh snap, we didn't talk about that because I assumed mm. that you knew yeah. that we weren't supposed to put those things out into yeah. public. Yeah. Like, and we all know the instances. Yeah. But that wasn't part of my onboarding process. And why wasn't it? And it's such a gap because okay, yeah. but again, we're adults. We should know what to post and what not to post because yeah. if students and families are following us. Yeah. I just didn't work that in. I think that was na being naive on my own part. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you a follow-up on that, Charlie, because okay. that's something I know I've faced that as a youth pastor. Are you, Caitlin? I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you faced that, but mm -hmm. I've had those moments too, and I've had to have the conversations yeah. of Hard. like, hey, maybe that's not best. Like, think about it. You have 14-year-olds that are like following your example, but we walk this fine line of like, we're all human beings. Yes. And yep. at times, I'm just going to say it. Sometimes it feels like the church puts an emphasis on certain things yep. and ignores other things. Agree. So how do you create a, a, a standard, but not just a standard, how do you shepherd and disciple volunteers to follow the way of Jesus in every area of their lives? I think if we had students who are posting things that we didn't think were healthy for them, mm -hmm. that same conversation applies to volunteers. That's and while good. I know you're a grown adult and yeah. you have a life, yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. But would you be having the same conversation with the 15 year old that you're discipling if uh -huh. they were to post this? Uh -huh. And so I've I've lived in the tension um, and I've gotten so, <laughs> I've gotten some really hard pushback from volunteers for oh, that yeah, because for sure. they're like, well, it's my life. Exactly. And, right. Yep. But gosh, if kids are watching us, mm -hmm. we have to live above reproach mm -hmm. and our team has to live above. reproach. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK. So I'm curious. I'm hearing a thread as everybody's talking and it's that. You know, Caitlin, you mentioned you've heard some stuff maybe come up or in passing in a small group. You're like, I need to address that later. Charlie, you're mentioning um, on the front end, whether it's processes or protocol or even noticing something and having to have hard, hard conversations. All those roads lead back to us mm -hmm. as a youth ministry leaders. What is our yeah. responsibility for not just the standards of, our, of volunteers in our ministry, but also of discipling volunteers in our ministry? So onboarding, let's mm -hmm. talk onboarding. I yeah, think that has been a gap it. for me because when I started in ministry, I came out of teaching. I kind of created this volunteer culture around what I thought a teacher should be oh, interesting. versus okay. a discipler, okay. which I think those are different. Mm -hmm. um, and my onboarding process stunk. Mm. And it took me years to develop a true process that when I bring volunteers on that they feel equipped and then I don't have issues with what they're saying or what they're doing and what they're posting. But man, ministry and life and coming up with that process took a minute. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this in a way where we just don't feel like the the morality, mm. you know, detectives or I, I'm just trying to think through like. I love it's this hard. morality you get, uh, detective. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think of like. This is that weird balance that we live in, but it's an important balance of being human. That is, we have real humans who are leading our students who are real humans and we're real humans and we want them to be like spiritually mature. Yeah. But how do you, how do you onboard for that? Like, how do you, how do you find that or even ask the right questions to determine if somebody's there? I know. I feel like I've been like asking myself that and I feel like my onboarding process is about to change because I had some like truly like stellar volunteers come mm -hmm. in and start this school year with our sixth grade girls group and they've done all like all of the things that on paper you would want someone to do like mm -hmm. they send notes they show up at games they have had them over for like sleepovers at their house like they go above and beyond and I feel like my onboarding process is shifting a little bit because they've shown me exactly what it is that we need as student ministry, mm -hmm. like for our volunteers to do. Mm. And so for me, I'm like rethinking the like, how do I show other volunteers that this is what the mm. students oh, need good. type yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, and it's not like we haven't been discipling them any different, but there's yeah. just something different there. Yeah. So I think that's changing things for me and just that's figuring good. out like, how do we replicate this and how do we onboard and then disciple our volunteers to grow them into that. Yeah, that's good, Caitlin. Ayubu, I'm curious, how do you even tell if someone has a level of spiritual maturity? Like when you're interviewing somebody or onboarding someone, how do you even determine that? I think so often as 
as we're interviewing people, we're so busy telling them about our ministry and what wow. their role is going to be. And we forget to listen about their passions and, and their lives wow. and, and really understanding who they are before we fit them into a role that we, we prayerfully thought about placing them into. That's so good. Because that might not be their phase in, in life right now. And we thought it was, and but we're we're just like, oh, well, this is it. Like I know, like, a, and you're like, well, no. How much time did you actually spend listening to their passions and their desires and their in their ministry? Yeah, yeah. Because you know they have a ministry. That's good. Okay, what kind of questions do you ask to determine these things? Like, if if we want to be good listeners, what kind of questions should we be asking to to be listening for the right things? I think always asking like to hear their testimony, like knowing oh, what their good. faith walk has looked like yeah. is super important. Yep. And I think a question that I really like asking is like why they want to volunteer in student ministry. Like did somebody disciple you in a way that like you want to replicate that? Or did you have like a missing hole with that and you want to make sure another student doesn't? Yeah. But just knowing those like personal motives behind it. That's good. Yeah. That's really good. I think when I'm recruiting volunteers, one of the things I do is I just pray and it's maybe not people that want to be in my ministry, but I really feel like God has put them on my heart. And so I'll invite them to a coffee, lunch, free, whatever, a sit down and listen to them. But I think one of the key things I asked was like, tell me about your spiritual journey. Like, what Ooh. does it look like? Who's discipled you? Yep. And how are you currently growing? Oh, yeah. Because oh, I think so the good. growth is big. That's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Ayubu, would you add anything to that? No, I mean, I guess it hit a lot of stuff right yeah. there. Yeah, I, I think, too. Um, that's such a good question of like, what does your current growth look like? Also, like, are you involved in community? Yes. Like the students you're going to be leading through community. Um, this is like a simple one, but like, you know, depending on your denomination, have you been baptized? Like yeah. those are, those are just key indicators that are not to be like, Oh, here's a box that I'm going to check. Here's one that's like left empty more. So these are conversations that, that you can have after you ask those questions. So it's not like, mm -hmm. have you checked all the boxes and you fit great? You're in. I, I think it's more of, this is an opportunity for you right out of the gate in the onboarding process to disciple those people that are a part of your church. Mm -hmm. Like there were, there are leaders who had made a decision to get baptized out of an interview that I had with them. Because they recognize or they realize for the first time, they're like, oh, yeah, this That's is a awesome. step I could take. And I think those are possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, that has happened. But I also want to share with you a <laughs> way that this has went wrong. Because oh. um, uh, <laughs> you, as you were talking about listening, I couldn't help but think about this moment. Um, it was so good. Uh, um, um, so somebody on my team had interviewed a potential volunteer. We onboarded this guy. He was just killer like such a good volunteer absolutely amazing but you know spiritual maturity is something that we ask about want to listen for so we went to summer camp incredible volunteer just crushing it uh you know night three or whatever the speaker gets up like delivers the talk and like presents the gospel we have the moment like hey stand up if you want to give your life to jesus for the very first time oh, no. and me and my my staff member like we're looking around and we're seeing what students are standing small group leaders paying attention and we look to our right and this small group leader is standing okay, to give his life to Jesus for the very first time, which is more than okay. But I literally look at my staff member and I go, did we ask this in the interview? <laughs> like, did we ask like, Hey dude, are you like following Jesus? Like, is this new to you? And it was like just this moment of like, Oh yeah, maybe like that's a question we should add <laughs> like in our process. It was a beautiful thing, but it was just so funny to see all of these students and one volunteer <laughs> who was there leading students through that moment be like, oh yeah, I think maybe I want to be a Christian too. We're like, oh, well, yeah, that's great. But, oh, I don't, we no. should. Okay. <laughs> I'm a longtime small group leader. Yeah. Still a small group leader. Yeah. Um, my first group of kids are 30 this year. Mm -hmm. And I will say my faith has grown with theirs. Yeah, a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's a big thing. And maybe can we give him? No, we can't give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe it was just the Holy Spirit bringing him to his feet. No? Yeah, sure. Sure. No, 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 no. 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 We give him all the benefits <laughs> of every doubt. But it was amazing. It I was love amazing it. to look and be like, oh, all right, great. Like yeah. this many students and one leader. That's you, fantastic. Did you put two more co-leaders with you? And, uh, well, th that's what I'm saying. You got to know where leaders are. You know what I mean? It was an amazing moment. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think that maybe just speaks to the importance of asking mm -hmm. good questions and listening well. Not that, you know, it would have changed a bunch, but it would have 
here's what this would have done. Had we been able to have those conversations early in the process, we would have been able to disciple him better. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been a moment yeah. at camp that he mm -hmm. experienced alongside his students who yeah. that moment was for. Like maybe we would have been able to have better That's conversations good. and lead him better. Um, so, so with that in mind, what I want to ask is where should a leader be before they join your team? Like spiritually? Yeah, spiritually. I just think that's so hard to evaluate. Mm -hmm, I agree. Even for my own spiritual walk. Yep. Right? Yep. But also I think as a leader, how am I modeling growth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that matters because mm -hmm. again, I know youth workers really well. I am one. Mm -hmm. And we get so busy working for God that we don't spend time with God. Yep. So as leaders, do we slow down enough and model that for our leaders? Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Okay. I think, and Shane, um, just kind of thinking on that, I think there's not a place they have to be, but I think an important part, like a discipline that should have is consistency. Yeah. So if they mm -hmm. are consistent in church or in small yeah. group, right? Yeah. Because, you know, we, we may find somebody that has a great personality and, and seems like a killer small group leader, but yeah. they're not consistent. Well, yeah. Then you're going to see that show up in their leadership of small groups. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think that's a valuable place to start is seeing consistency in their lives in other places. That's good. That's really good. Caitlin, what would you add? Um, I would just say like, for me, it's super important that like they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and savior. <laughs> like yeah. that's just like <laughs> bottom line. I've had volunteers who have like wanted to start leading, but are asking like a ton of the huge questions still, like still have questions about like, yeah is like mm -hmm. Jesus who he says he, like yeah. just take him to camp yeah it'll <laughs> yeah. sort like, everything out they'll be standing <laughs> night three yeah and move but, a god you know yeah. sorry no I just think I think that's really important like base level like you got to have that for me yeah. but I think it is important for the students to see that you're growing in your faith mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. so like you don't have to be like at that like peak point of your faith to like percent. step in as a leader I think it's super important for yep. like students to witness leaders who like wrestle with some questions yeah. yep. and are still like trying to grow and get closer to Jesus every single day. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, Caitlin, I would agree with that entirely. So I, I think I would be in the same place specifically for the role of small group leader. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another key factor yeah. here. I, like when I'm talking about, or even Caitlin, I don't want to speak for you, but I, but I hear you saying if a leader is going to be a small group leader, they need to have they need to at least be following Jesus, yeah. right? Like I feel that same way for a small group mm -hmm. leader. But let me tell you, there are, were volunteers on other teams that we had. Yeah. They were mm -hmm. they were greeting, they were helping yep. with set up teardown, like or they were just involved in other areas that weren't really sure about all the Jesus mm -hmm. stuff. So there are this is my personal philosophy. There should be opportunities for yes. everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. But just because the small group leader is one of those opportunities doesn't mean that it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. I always think yep. about this funnel, mm -hmm. right? And so at the top, it's the pizza passer outer or the greeter. And as they move deeper down into the funnel, that spiritual walk has to be deeper too. Yes. Because the 100%. role is different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I just think there's such a high, um, not just high expectation, but there's a high responsibility with the role of small group leader because they are pastoring, you yeah. know, the next generation as a whole, that that's one where we may want to look for more spiritual maturity. Yeah. But I, I don't think we just want to look for it. We probably also want to help them develop it. So I'm curious... Mm -hmm. How do you do that as a youth ministry leader? I think, um, one, like we have to start by modeling it ourselves. So like mm -hmm. we have to be getting into the word and praying and like yeah, growing ourselves. Good. But I think when we disciple them, it's like making sure that they do have those daily habits in place and oh, helping good. them form them. If it's maybe not something that they're doing already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I think for me over the years, it was leading different studies like during easter mm. we would do um, an entire lent study together as a team oh that's so good y utilizing the uversion bible app i mean there's several really great devos on there there's a lead small devotion yeah. right and mm -hmm. you could do that with your team yep. like always be doing things to help them grow sharing what you're learning your podcast what you're reading yeah um because sometimes they may not know where to go outside of your church yeah but there's so many great resources out there yeah. keep sharing with your team and then do things with them that's good charlie i want to i want to follow up on that though because that's a mindset shift again for some leaders you're going take that time do that with your volunteers yeah. but maybe by default we go let's do that with our students so how did you shift oh. in your thinking i'm sorry see i'm a youth worker and that means i lead adults <laughs> that's so good no, say, more, say more no, say more say more that's really what it means yeah yeah um, yeah 
being a youth worker is not sitting on the floor with the students. See, that's a volunteer role. Wow. And that's not what I'm paid to do. My wow. job as a paid youth worker is to lead adults well so that then they can pastor the students. Whew. Whew. Now, say, say it again. If you're a first time, <laughs> if you're a first year youth worker and you're hearing this and you're like, oh, snap, I signed yeah. up for the wrong thing. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. I've interviewed people for teammates before and they're like, oh, I can't wait to be with the students and sit with them and yeah. do all these things. And I love that. Yeah. Probably not going to hire for that. How do you, how do you, like build a cycle of training, um, mm. in order to do this as well. Cause I, I know there's always like, I always felt the, the pressing things of like, we got to train for camp. We got to go through all the logistics. We got to do those things. But how could we begin to like train formally when it comes to spiritual formation? I think making sure we're working that into our trainings. Like I feel like so often it's easy to host a volunteer training cause it's the beginning of the year and you need to touch on all of like X, Y, and Z logistical things yeah. that you like, I know I'm guilty of this sometimes. Like you breeze past the spiritual part of wow. it. Like we don't take the moment at the beginning to like dive into the word a little bit together and spend some time in prayer together before mm -hmm. getting to the like, all right, here's the nitty gritty details. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. So I was visiting a church. Um, I think I was speaking at their like regular Sunday night mm -hmm. and the youth worker has their team show up 45 minutes. Yes, folks, 45 minutes yeah. before the night starts. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, oh, well, three people's going to show up because that would probably be my track record. Yeah. The whole team is there. Oh, that's amazing. And they're in this room and they're all opening their Bibles and they're diving in together with scripture before the night even started. Now, that's a culture shift. Yeah. That's something that you've had to have in place. It's something yeah. that you have to have high value on to get people to show up to. Yeah. Um, I've never met a team that was more invested in their students. Oh, I bet. Right? Yeah, that's amazing. And I've been to lots of churches over the years, mm -hmm. speaking and things, mm -hmm. and I've never met a group of volunteers that cared so deeply for the students in their community. Wow. That's but it's amazing. a culture shift. Yeah, yeah. And I think you have to, when you're recruiting, hey, yeah. this is what we do. This is just being part of our team. Yeah. You know, I would say I would want like 10 of those types of volunteers over a hundred of oh, like half bought in yes. or like fun and cool, but, but it's so hard. Cause I don't, I don't want to sound judgmental, but are, are maybe behind or not quite, you know, in that place that we would want for small group leaders to be when it comes to spiritual formation and spiritual maturity. Like I, I would take 10 of the yeah. volunteers you're describing over a hundred of the but others. They're like their own family. Yeah. Like when one of the small group leaders, um, volunteers on this, at this church was going through something, mm -hmm. all of those people in the room showed up. Okay. So it's so much more than showing up than for the students. Yeah. It was creating a culture within their volunteers. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're mm -hmm. not just talking about spiritual maturity. You're talking about community and the depths that I think we're all searching for. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Um, okay. So, I'm the youth worker, uh, Yubu, I feel like you alluded to this earlier. I'm the youth worker that's like, yeah, but I just need people. I just need small group leaders. And, you know, Charlie and I are both going, yeah, but maybe you don't need as many if you can find this, you know, this type of small group leader. Um, what what would you say to them? Or, or how, how do you begin to prioritize having the right leaders and not just a leader? I think you got to start by setting expectations. Like if you don't have written expectations, then you don't have a target. Oh, that's good. For them yeah. to hit. I mean, yeah. if, and, and that's part of it is I think we, that's, we don't know what the expectations many times when we're approaching them. And mm -hmm. so like, if we don't have it written down and, and clear cut, like, Hey, this is the expectation. If you can't meet it, yeah. then I've got another role for you. Oh, that's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I want you to be a part that's of ministry, but then when you do feel like you can meet these, I, I see it in you. That's good. And, that's and, good. and I would love to. So I think that's part of it is just that, like Charlie said, man, just that expectation. Yeah. Not that's how, you know, we don't just get warm bodies in a room. Yeah. That's good. Caitlin, in, in your context where you're leading, do you have multiple roles for volunteers? We do. Yeah. I mean, they stem from like, you've got your small group leaders, you've got guest service type positions mm -hmm. for welcoming first time guests or checking in regular guests. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got programming volunteers. I mean, there's any number of volunteer roles that we're always looking to fill and get people in. So yeah. 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 
That's good. Um, did you mind sharing, like, what are, what are some of the expectations you have for small group leaders specifically? I know you shared some yeah. of the questions that maybe you ask mm-hmm. them, but like if you're sitting across from a small group leader interviewing them, what do you need to hear in order to go, yeah, you're the right fit for a small group leader? I need to hear that they're going to be consistent, number one. I mean, yeah. we all get life happens and there mm-hmm. are going to be Sundays that you're sick or something comes up with your family and you cannot be there. But the expectation is like, yeah, I'm going to be there, mm-hmm. like whether it's Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, like that's a priority for mm-hmm. me. So hearing that and then just hearing the willingness and the desire to meet students where they're at, yeah. whether that's at school, at a game, like showing up for them when something rough's going on. Yeah. Like, I think needing to hear like that they're in it for the right reason. I think a lot of times people start volunteering yep. because they feel like it's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> they mm. have attended church for a while and they're plugged in and now they're like, oh, okay, time to volunteer, yeah. which is great. And that might be like a role that I plug you into like, hey, guest services, but are you like wanting to lead in students Mm -hmm. because you want students to fully follow Jesus and you want them to grow closer every day to him. Cause Mm. if that's it, then yeah, like I'll sign you up today. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. Charlie, would you add anything to that? I was really thinking about what you were saying. I, so many times I don't, I don't think anyone's ever came to me and built dying to get on my team. Oh really? I think I've always pursued people. Oh, interesting. Right. And I think the pursuit is different because what I've seen in you as a human in my church is this beautiful, like walk with Jesus. And I need a student to see that. Wow. And I, I would love for you to be a part of their lives. Wow. And that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. And I, I work a lot with smaller churches and they're like, we just, we just can't get anybody. Yeah, for sure. But, you're wait, are you waiting for people to come to you? Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I don't know. That's that. No one's been banging down my door to volunteer on a student ministry team. Mm. I, I like to pursue people because yeah. when I see values of generosity and kindness and boldness in your faith, yeah. man, I want, I want that student to sit with you. That's good. I feel like no matter what context you're leading in, that's an important principle to grab mm. hold of. Like whether you're in a small church or large church setting, yeah. or you have an overflow of volunteers, which I don't think anybody does, but let's just imagine. (laughs) Um, Or you're really seeking, you know, a a ton to pursue the right ones. When you see somebody whose faith maybe you admire, when you see somebody whose spiritual maturity, you're like, oh my gosh, I want our students to look like that when they're older. Maybe that's the type of person to go after versus like, who's the cool person that will get a lot of students to show up. Maybe that winds up being the right person. I don't want to knock that. They could be in that place. But we begin to look for a different type of leader when we think that way. So I love that, Charlie. Well, and again, like you guys are mentioning, you know, when you start intentional like that, mm-hmm. then you get a, a community built like you were the one you were just sharing about earlier, Charlie. And then people are going to pers- like pursue you. Yeah. Because they're going to say, I want that. Like, I don't have that community that the, that that group that team has i want to be a part of that yeah and i think good. if you build it well from the ground up you're gonna okay. you're gonna get to a point where people are pursuing you and you're not having to pursue anymore i feel like one of the things over the last few years that we've discovered about the church in america it's full of a lot of adults who may not be as spiritually mature as we thought they were okay or they haven't matured to the point that we th- had designed our programs to help them mature to So now as youth workers, we're trying to find these adults and we're trying to disciple them. I'm curious, like, have you all felt that? And this to me, this is like the line that I feel like I've been teetering on in this conversation of like, I don't want to pass judgment on the adults Mm -hmm. in our church, but I don't know about you all. It's really hard to find the volunteer that we're talking about. And what do we do with that? Like, what is our responsibility as youth pastors in that current reality of the church? At least the, the... the the church context that I've I've seen here here in the U.S. So I'm currently serving in young adult ministry mm-hmm. at my church, and I think that's a different level of maturity. Yeah. To pastor twenty something. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I've just been looking at the grandmas and the grandpas in the room, because they've been able to not only disciple their families, um, but Gosh, their walk with Jesus is strong. Mm. Now, here's the negative to that. <laughs> what what they keep telling me is I've done my time. They don't, they're not, they don't, <laughs> right? And they're like, this generation, and they're hesitant to yeah. step into the life of a 22-year-old. Yeah. But I think my role is to reassure them that they've got all it takes. Yeah. That God has given them this skill set. And I just know they love people really well. Because I've seen your family. I've seen your grandkids. Yep. Can you, would you just give it a try? Oh, that's good. 
Yeah, that's but so But there's good. some resistance. Yep. And also, um, if I was a 22-year-old and I walked in the room and it's all 86-year-olds, <laughs> what does that feel? Do you know what I mean? I've been on both sides of it. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the right thing, but my church, I, I'm in a very small church, mm-hmm. and I think these are the best people. Yeah. I don't know. Gen Z, like, they I, vibe that way. Come on, coastal grandmas in yeah. the room? Let's go. <laughs> like, they fit, they fit the look and feel. It'll wear. They match the aesthetic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, Charlie, <sighs> I think what you just said is so, so important because we, we talk a lot about like the, the spiritual maturity or, or, and, and these are not synonymous, but the other thing is biiblical literacy of Gen Z mm-hmm. and Gen Alpha. And we talk about them being low, yeah. you know, who else it's low with millennials yep. and millennials are the ones that are filling these roles. Mm-hmm. So for you to go, let's go up, like, let's get the boomers yep. in the room and have them investing in the next generation might be one of the smartest things that you can do right now. Uh, you, Caitlin, what do you all think about that? No, I think that's totally true. I think also there's something to be said for having multi gener like multi generational volunteers. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got to have like the volunteers for, like ne- next life stage and everything. But I do agree. Like looking at that, like slightly older generation who has the more life experience has mm-hmm. like probably walked through like very high highs and very low lows. Like yeah. and has the biblical knowledge that maybe somebody who's in their twenties doesn't yet. Yeah. So I think it it's important to look beyond just like the volunteers that students are going to think are cool based on how young they are and how they look when they walk in the yeah, room. Yeah, that's so smart. Plus, they, those people have a little bit more margin in their life, too. They're not having to rush <laughs> to a ballpark, and they're not... Well, they don't rush to- anywhere, Yubu. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But I think I just think it, it, that's that's a win, yeah. right? Because I think we, we think we got to get these young families, and then we burn them out because they're you know so we're actually setting up setting them up for a loss later on too because then they get so burned out mm-hmm. from church and everything and yep. then they, they slowly start to fade even out of just being a part of the community of of church oh you're so right and then they come back when they're 80 <laughs> right you know it's like what <laughs> we're talking Charlie's about is ready to snap them up <laughs> <laughs> you know so i no, just think so it's smart. being really intentional yeah. about that too yeah mm. one of my best volunteers ever her, her name is Jeannie, and i think she's still volunteering at one of the churches that i worked at um she she may be listening to because she I loves love orange to death <laughs> um but she is a grandmother um i remember when she first stepped into the middle school space she was like i don't really know but what what the reason why she crushed it as a volunteer is because she was prioritizing her own relationship with jesus mm. And she was not at all trying to be something to the students that she was mm-hmm. not. Yeah. And like that to me is not just spiritual maturity, that's maturity. And when you can find that, it doesn't just have to be in somebody who's a grandmother or somebody who's maybe generations ahead of them. It can be in somebody who's 25, but gets it. You know what I mean? And when yeah. you find those people, you got to you gotta keep them and not mm-hmm. let them go because they can revolutionize the ministry and build the culture yep. that you're looking for. Um, look, I think discipling, uh, volunteers is so, so important. I think there's a lot to rethink here. What I noticed is we didn't give a lot of answers, but I think that's okay because I'm not sure anybody has them right now. We just have to think through what does it look like to begin to prioritize this in new ways? Um, before we go though, I want to ask you all, uh, maybe an inverse question, uh, uh, that, uh, f- okay. from what we've been talking about. So we've talked a lot about like moral markers and like spiritual formation markers and all of that. I don't know if you all have experienced this, but there are volunteers who have all of those things, but still would not be spiritually mature. They are reading their Bible. They're showing up to all the things. Mm -hmm. They've been baptized. They've taken the steps. They made the decision. But when it comes to certain things in their life, you're like, well, wait a second. That may not be the best example. Like the, the amount of gossip that is being spread here, or you know what I mean? The judgment that you pass on certain students, that would always, that would bother me. Like Mm -hmm. judgment to a student when you're their leader. And I'm like, that's not spiritual maturity. Like that, that is the opposite. What do you do with that type of leader? And I guess what I'm asking is how do you, how do you tell the difference um, from spiritual maturity to, I don't know what may be just like pride. Mm. I don't know. Is there a polygraph test of sorts for volunteers? <laughs> like, I don't know how yeah. you, I don't know how you figure that out, Shane. Honestly, yeah. I yeah. think it's after time. Hmm. But then do you have to fire a volunteer? Ooh. That's a whole different podcast. We can talk about fi- firing yeah. volunteers yeah. because you have to. Yeah. If you're listening, you have to fire. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I don't know because sometimes those things don't show up in the first month or six months, but eight months down the road, you see those things. Yeah. And then I get a little panic and my armpits sweat because I'm like, oh my gosh, have they been doing harm? Have they been, you know, saying things yeah. I didn't know that they yep. were going to say yep. because they checked all the boxes. Yep. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So let me ask the question this way. How do you disciple someone through that? Yeah. Because that's the responsibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe it's not to fire. Maybe it's to op the op I mean, yes, you have to fire volunteers sometimes, and that's it's difficult. But if we're talking about discipling volunteers, how would you disciple a volunteer mm -hmm. who's in that place? I think you have to be okay having that difficult conversation first. Mm -hmm. Like that's not going to be fun for you. It's yeah. going to be uncomfortable. But being willing to go into that situation and like address the fact, like, hey, you're a great volunteer, but we're noticing a couple things that maybe aren't the best, and mm -hmm. like let's sit down and talk about it and try to like figure out what the like underlying reason is. I mean, why are they passing judgment on a student mm -hmm. or like doing X, Y, and Z, like trying to figure out there's probably an area that they need to like wrestle with some stuff and walk mm -hmm. through some stuff and probably just need you to come alongside yeah. and help with that. Yeah, that's good. I just think part of uh, one, one too is just having a consistent um, rhythm with them. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. uh, like our family ministry planner that we just put out, like I yeah. love one of the, things on the calendar is coffee with a volunteer. Oh, that's so smart. And so like, if you're like, not just meeting with them when there's a problem, but just consistent relationship with them that, yeah. so like when you are sitting with them at coffee and you start hearing like, oh, they're gossiping a lot. Yeah. Then you, then you could talk to them about that there before they start and then just, and, and help them not, get in the the mindset of gossip right yeah. as you do coffee with them in life and then that will translate trickle down into in not gossiping with the students yeah and that's so true. it's just that's part of it it's just that having that rhythm that's so good in in your ministry that's so good this has been such a good conversation um caitlin charlie ayubu uh this is this is so important. Mm -hmm. I think what I feel challenged in from this conversation and all the wisdom that you all shared is we have to look at our roles, not just as recruiters of volunteers, not just as trainers of volunteers, but as shepherds of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And you know what shepherding is? It's messy sometimes. And it's messy in a bunch of different ways, but maybe that's the biggest takeaway from this is as we head into whatever the future of youth ministry looks like and we rethink this, the, maybe the first place to start rethinking is what does it look like to consider yourself a shepherd of yeah. not just your students, but of your volunteers as well. We want to thank everybody for listening to the Rethinking Youth Ministry podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'd love to hear how you're discipling your volunteers. DM us at Orange Students and let us know. We'll see you next time on the Rethinking Youth Ministry podcast.